me say that again. Sometimes the challenge creates the masterpiece. Now that was what my 17 year old son said to me this week as I was lamenting the fact that I had chosen the more difficult of the New Testament passage from which to preach on this morning. I've always called this child of mine an old soul because ever since he was little, he used to say things and observe things that were beyond what you might expect from someone his age. And I was working on the sermon earlier this week, and I, I needed to get the scripture to Robbie to get into the bulletin and get all that information tied up. And, and I picked this scripture and was fretting about it. You see, here's my process as a minister who doesn't preach every Sunday, and as a second career minister who's, who's fairly new to preaching, I have a method that I use to try to help develop a sermon. And it involves reading the scripture several times and praying about it, then reading it again and, and making some observations and some notes and, and then delving into what other people have written about the scripture in commentaries or what they've written about the topic that seems to be emerging. And this week, when I, start, when I got to that point, I started seeing a lot of commentary that I liked about the Luke scripture, not much about Hebrews. I thought, oh no, what have I done to myself? I, I picked the harder scripture the harder thing to preach on. Now, my son, in his comment about masterpieces and challenges, he cited a couple of examples. He said, you know, the Sistine Chapel is all the more impressive because it was painted 100 feet up in the air and it's on the ceiling. And then he also told me that in his own personal experience recently, he had been talking with a friend of his who's about his academic ability. They're, they're both pretty bright kids and do well at school. And they were talking about an exam that they had taken. And there was an easy essay question and one that was a little bit more difficult. Well, his friend picked the easier prompt to write about. And my son picked the one that was a little bit more difficult. And all things comparatively similar, uh, what happened in this situation is that the one that chose the more difficult one got a substantially better score on his test than the one that chose the easy one. So sometimes the easy way is not the best way. And my old soul son has a point. Because when I really started looking at this scripture, I saw that it had something that was both very, very simple and easy to understand, but very, very deep as well. Now, the first four words in this scripture sort of sum up everything, if we think about it, that is a challenge to us to live as disciples of Christ. To live in a culture where to model one's life after Christ is it's countercultural and it's counterintuitive. You see, our culture says that power and career and money, these are the markers of success. But following Christ means that the love of God the love of neighbor, a selfless focus, is more important. So these four words, the first verse of our scripture this morning, sum up the rest of the text. So I'd like for you to help me, help us remember these words. If you have one of those index cards with you, I'd like for you to take a look at it now. And if you have the word let, on your card. Just hold it up. Just hold it up so I can see the picture. Okay, good. There's some of you. Okay, some of you should have the word mutual. Do you have that one? Hold it up. Great. Okay. And some of you should have the word love on your card. Can you hold that up? Great. And the, the last word, some of you should have the word continue. Okay, good. What we're going to do, y'all are going to help me, and we're going to hear this verse over and over. Okay? So, when I say let, I want all of the, those of you who have the word let on your card say let. When I say mutual, the ones that have mutual on your card say mutual, and so on. Okay, we're going to do this together a couple times. So let's try. Let mutual, mutual. Love, love continue. Now, if you know all four of them, you can say them all with me. I was trying to make it easy for you this morning. But let's try it again. Let, let mutual love Continue. Let's say it one more time. <coughs> Let, Let mutual love continue. That's very good. Y'all are very good at participation.
attention. You got warmed up with the children's sermon and got you to speak now too. Um, but these four words, they are, are very central to, well, what the sermon title is, which is Thrive. It's how to thrive as, as a Christian, as a disciple, how to walk this walk. Let's look at them individually, and then we'll look at them all together. Now, that first word is little. It's the smallest one, just three letters, let, L-E-T. And let means don't pamper, don't prevent. Let it um, make it possible for something to occur. And you can think about how we use this word. Let me help you, which means allow me to help you. Let it be, which means don't touch, don't change, don't manipulate something. Let it go to, to release something, to not impede what is happening. Now, in the early church, even then, there was the danger that selfishness and the natural human desire for power and things would prevail and that would impede the progress, the letting that this verse talks about. So how do we go about letting? What does that look like for us individually and as a group, corporately? Individually, letting means allowing. And when we talk about allowing in terms of the scripture today, we, we allow ourselves to be open to the other, to the person who is imprisoned or tortured, to the stranger we haven't met. Then there's the next word, mutual, which means something that is shared, and it implies relationship. Two parties are involved. Something cannot be mutual unless it's shared. Mutuality is something that defines us as a church, doesn't it? We are in relationship with each other. We support each other. We pray for each other. We support each other in good times and bad times. It is the fellowship being together. And then love. A favorite word for a lot of people. Love. What is love? Love is a, a deep connection. Some say love is a verb, it's, it's an action. It's how we treat the people we hold dear. Perhaps how we treat people we don't even know. Love of God, love of spouse. The scripture this morning talks about love of those who lead us. People who've taught you about the faith. And then those that we lead. Love of those who suffer, who are imprisoned or martyred. Sometimes they've been in prison or martyred for their faith. Now I looked up, up the word love on online, of course, and Wikipedia had this definition from biologist Jeremy Griffith, who defined love as unconditional selflessness. Unconditional selflessness. That sounds like the definition of Christian community to me. It what happens is what happens when we practice Christianity together. We unselfishly give of ourselves to other. And that might mean prison ministry or a way of supporting married couples in the church by offering help in small group classes on relationship building skills or on parenting. Love. And then the last word is continue. Keep it going. How do you keep something going? Now, this insinuates that there was a beginning and that there will be an end. Love begun by a compassionate God who loved us so much and is so willing to give his life that God gives us those second and third and fourth and sometimes fifth chances. He sent both the Son to bear our sins and the Holy Spirit to help guide us, to not abandon us. And when we put these words together, can you say it with me again? Let, Let mutual, mutual love continue. continue. What do they mean together? Well, Hebrews, if you go back and read the whole book, and I encourage you to do that, it's not very long. It's really a sermon. It's a sermon that speaks about the priesthood of Christ and of the sacrifice that makes this so. And in this last chapter, chapter 13 of Hebrews, we have reminders. They're, they're exhortations on how to live, show hospitality, take care of the prisoner, the married couple and the focus that marriage should be on. Don't love money. Depend on God to provide. 
Offer sacrifices of praise, do good, and share with others, for that is what is pleasing to God. Now, how do we do all of these things? How do we mark our lives as different? You know, John Wesley, the founder <coughs> of Methodism, he encouraged both acts of mercy, which are attending to the needs of the world, the broken world, and acts of piety, what we are doing now, worship and prayer and song and fellowshipping together. Both uh, works of piety, acts of piety and acts of mercy, depend on us understanding how to let mutual love continue. Now in verse 2, if we go on, another word stands out that's really important in the scripture, and that's the word hospitality. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now this week in my preparation, I read a blog from Eric King, who's a seminary professor, and he said that the Greek word, traditionally translated to the English word hospitality, is philoxenia which literally means love of the strange. Now, I thought that was pretty interesting. Love of the strange. If you think about the world in the ancient times, it was, it was really a very small world for lots of people. People didn't go very far from their birthplaces. It was expensive to travel, and if you wanted to travel and had needed a place to stay, there was... No Holiday Inn or Red Roof or Motel 6. It was dangerous. So if you wanted to know more about the world, one way to learn more about outside of your little world, what was going on out there, is to allow travelers to come into your home. And that's what people did. They opened their homes to travelers, and it benefited the host and the traveler. The guests received food and protection, and the host got news and stories about the outside world. Mutual benefit. Love of the strange is hospitality. It, it, can mean, it can mean opening up our eyes to think, doing things differently, to see the needs in our community that we may not have noticed before. Now, in some ways, our churches today are similar to that ancient world. Sometimes we're kind of insulated and, and we keep to ourselves. It's, it's difficult in some churches to find a place if you are not related to someone in the church by blood or by marriage. We're friendly, but in some churches that means we're friendly to each other. And it's a little bit harder if you come in from the outside. And hospitality is, is a skill that we have to be constantly aware of and realize that we need to be hospitable not just to ourselves but to everyone else. Now I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here because I know that this congregation reaches out in a big way to their community. But we always have to keep that in our mind, that we need to be conscious of, of how we are being hospitable to others. And I learned a lesson in hospitality by participating in something outside of the church that, that came about because of my, my life situation. You see, in 1996, the, this was kind of the advent of specialized lists being formed online. They were just starting to develop. The technology was just starting to be there. And, and there were email lists that you could subscribe to where people talked about their hobbies, about gardening, about computer programming, or, or about woodworking. There were lists for people who were doing genealogy. And then there were lists for people like me who were starting their families. And they wanted to reach out to other parents who had children of the same age. And so these lists started springing up. They, they would call themselves the April 95 babies or the June 96 babies or whatever month and year that the children were being born in. And, and they would email each other back and forth. And I was kind of isolating myself at home, staying home with my children. My youngest son was just, had just been born. And so I had a three-year-old and a newborn. And I reached out, I looked online for some help and some parenting questions that were coming up, and I found one of these communities. Now, this list that has now been around for 17 plus years has been sort of a constant in my life. It has members all over the country, in fact, all over the world, 
We have four of the, and the list is called the March 96 list. That's when my son was born. The March 96 list has four members who live in North Carolina, and there's some all across this country, a few in Canada. There's uh, at least one in each of these countries, in Belgium and Australia and Iceland and uh, Canada. Okay, all of these countries, and Saudi Arabia, that's where we also have a member. We've developed over all these years of emailing back and forth every day a very caring community. And I've met some of these parents, mostly moms, in real life. The first time was in Charlotte when Gideon was just a baby. The ones that lived at that time in North Carolina, we got together to meet each other for the first time. And from the very beginning, we weathered good and bad things together. One of the moms was widowed pretty early in our relationship as a community, and we were there with her. One of them um, was diagnosed with breast cancer a few years ago, and we organized to make a quilt for her. Everyone made a square and sent it to me, and then three other members of the group came, one from Asheville, one from Los Angeles, and one from Seattle. They came to my house, and we put that quilt together in a weekend. And we drove for three hours to her house and gave the quilt to her. Let mutual love continue. Started seeing this developing in this group. One of the more memorable times for me with the March 96 group was when we had one of our regional get togethers. And this one happened to be in Ohio, kind of a central spot. And we gathered for a long weekend at a hotel that had an indoor pool. So that time we all had 10 year olds or nine or 10 year olds, I believe was the age then. And as the moms arrived, I met some of these people that I knew very well because we talked about potty training, we talked about uh, teething, we talked about the first day of school and how to deal with homework and how to balance all the extracurricular activities and siblings. We knew each other, but we met face to face for the first time. And it was, it was really astounding to me to meet these people that I knew so well and to be able to, say, leave a group of moms watching my kid at the pool while I went with another group and we went and got supper for the whole group. Now this group has always included a variety of faiths. Some who practice no religious faith at all. But we have an understanding between us that we respect each other and we have a healthy interest in what it's like in other families and other geographic locations. And I've learned most of what I know actually about Judaism. I first learned it from this group because there are several Jewish families that participate. And on this occasion, when we were having to get together in Ohio, one of the Jewish families invited some of us to come to her room, her suite, for the end of their Sabbath celebration. Now, they, they celebrate Sabbath, Sabbath. Their Sabbath is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And there is a little celebration at the end, what they call Havdala. Then it involves lighting candles, and uh, you have a sip of either water or wine. You sing some songs, and you say some words. The last part of the blessing says, Blessed are you, Lord, who separate between sacred and secular. Amen. And as I sat there at that table in this room with these people that had been involved in a lot of the details of my life, but in some ways I had just met them. I looked across and, and there across the table was my conservative Christian friend. And beside me to the right was my Catholic friend. And beside me to the left was my friend whose family is Muslim. And then there were some other Methodists and some other denominations, Christian denominations represented there. And, and there was also the Jewish families that were celebrating with us. And it just made my heart sing. And I thought about this in terms of our scripture. Let mutual love continue. See, this group has celebrated with joys and difficulties all my life, including my journey to ordination. And although we are of different faiths, they celebrated with me when I was commissioned. And when I've gone through dark times, flowers and cards have shown up on my doorstep. Let mutual love continue. Now for me, this is a model of how we, the church, must be for each other. For the people that Hebrews was written for, the original sermon, we must understand if we were to fulfill what God has called us to do, what it means to let mutual love continue. 
We must remember to let mutual love continue by offering hospitality to the strange and the stranger. By remembering with deep empathy those who are imprisoned and tortured. By supporting families and marriages. By, by not letting the love of money make us forget that God can and does provide for all our needs. And we must let mutual love continue by being in relationship with each other and with the triune God, with the Creator who has given us great gifts, and the Savior who has redeemed us with the sacrifice, and the Holy Spirit that guides us and walks with us. And we must let mutual love continue so that when the world thinks about Christians, they don't think about our neighbor down the street who, who may be preaching hate from his pulpit. That we must let our lives be the book that people read to understand what following Christ is all about. We must let mutual love continue so that this world sees us living as disciples of Christ, modeling our lives after the life that Jesus lived and offering to the world hope and grace and peace. Let us leave this place today, sure of our paths, with these words resounding in our ears. If you would, please say these words with me and go from this place to live these words. Let, Let mutual love, love continue. continue. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.